Hello, welcome back to our last lecture on public key infrastructures. You might have a feeling by now that PKI does not work exactly just as well as one would like. In particular, the case of X509. And in particular, after learning how certificate revocation works or should work and doesn't really work, see the last mini lecture. Now in this last lecture, I would like to talk about the substantial improvements that have been made to X509 over the last five to seven years. Let's take a step back in history because it can be both entertaining and instructive. The dangers of having this multi-CA root store where each CA is equal to every other CA, this famous forest of disjoint trees. Well, these dangers were actually recognized pretty early. For example, Radia Perlman wrote a paper about it or a longer paper that included it in 1999. Carl Ellison and Bruce Schneier wrote another one in 2000. And the consensus of these authors was always, the cryptography is not our problem. Our public key cryptography works pretty well. The big problem that we have are the operational practices like identity verification by a CA, which you may recall was initially done by insecure email. There are some better practices today. However, identity verification is still by far not as secure as you might want, uh, as you might want it to be. And attacks did occur. They are poorly documented, that is true, but they occurred as early as 2001 with a famous forged certificate uh, for a Microsoft um, certificate. And uh, they became a lot more widely known since 2008, when a number of small scale attacks were staged against CAs. Now, you might have heard of the term DigiNotar, which was uh, an important CA in the Netherlands. And there is a prelude to the story of DigiNotar. In March 2011, a so-called subseller of the Komodo CA was hacked. In essence, a business that was kind of a franchise to uh, Komodo, we can at least think of it as a franchise, and that could trigger the issuance of a new certificate. And they were hacked. And uh, they issued about 10 certificates that we know of for high value domains. And uh, this was actually found when people inspected the uh, source code of uh, browsers and suddenly found that, hey, all browsers are suddenly blacklisting a number of certificates in the source code. Why? Why are they doing this? Well, yes, because the CA was hacked. Why did they not use revocation? Think about it for a moment. I'll give you my poker face for a few seconds so you can stop the video and then return. All right, let's continue. The reason is once a CA is actually hacked and compromised and you don't have a good idea how much it has been compromised, it is safest to assume it has been completely compromised, which means all private keys have been compromised, including those that you need to create revocation lists and implement OCSP. Hence, browsers had no choice. In order to avoid attacks using those certificates, they had to blacklist certificates in their own source code. And that is how the entire thing came to the light, or at least it came to the light a little bit earlier than the browsers had uh, intended to, uh, to, uh, to do, because Komodo had uh, asked for a short period um, uh, where the news about this hack was sanctioned, so these uh, blacklisted certificates could be rolled out in the browser source code. Interestingly, the attacker began to communicate with the public, claimed to come from Iran, and uh, he is indeed, or they are indeed assumed to have control over the CA's private keys. That was in March, 2011. Fast forward a few months when the same thing happened to DigiNotar. DigiNotar to this day has the rather dubious distinction of being the most famous and successful attack against the CA. The attacker claimed to be the same one as in March, but this time he did it a little bit more extensively. There are at least 531 fake certificates that we know of issued for high value domains, including Google, Facebook, Mozilla, for good measure, the CIA and Mossad, but also Skype. There is some evidence that these certificates might have been used at, uh, in a person in a middle attack in Iran. If you want, Google for the terms Operation Black Tulip. 
and then look for a report by a company called Fox IT, which investigated how this entire uh, hack could really happen, how the compromise happened. I promise you, during a rainy afternoon, that is highly entertaining literature. Diginota became famous because it was the first time that a CA was actually removed from a browser root store for being compromised, in particular for being compromised and not having noticed very much in the first place themselves. Now, enter a defense that has been proposed by Google and is now an internet standard, certificate transparency. I'll give you the ideas. The fundamental idea of certificate transparency, as the name implies, it's about transparency, is that you're going to log information about every certificate that has been issued. And you're going to log it with a number of distinct parties. The logs are implemented in a particular kind of data structure that is publicly readable, but is append only. Their goal is to have an audit trail. The logs do not care at all if the information they receive and log is correct. They're completely agnostic to it. All they guarantee you is that they are not going to delete or modify previous entries and the information is publicly available and every new entry that they add is going to be signed and timestamped. This makes it quite transparent who issues certificates to whom and when, if you can get the buy-in of CAs to log which was possible in this particular case because Google was behind the standard. Now, the logs are going to talk to everyone. They are publicly available. So anyone can verify their content and their correct operation as well. And anyone can try and find if there is a rogue CA that is issuing certificates for a domain after the fact, after this has happened. The goal of certificate transparency is to detect that something has happened and to make it transparent who is responsible, but it is not a direct defense for clients. One little uh, more information, of course, you would like to avoid that locks are somehow clustered in one particular jurisdiction. So the standard envisages that about 30 or 40 locks are going to be positioned around the globe by different parties in different jurisdictions. Now, how does certificate transparency work? Here are the key ideas. The technology is a lot more complex than that. That's also one criticism of it. But we're going to give you the most important ideas now. Two, be uh, accepted into the Chrome browser store. Every CA must participate in certificate transparency. That's how the entire system was pushed into the market. And a CA must lock the issuance of a certificate with at least two locks to incorporate it. The locks are going to return a so-called signed certificate timestamp, proving that they have accepted the certificate for inclusion. The SCT technically does not say the certificate has already been included. It only guarantees it is going to include it within a short time span. The SCTs are intended to be forwarded to the actual domain operator and clients, browsers, learn about SCTs via various methods. One is the most common, included directly in the certificate that has been issued. But there are different methods that can, in theory, be used. This gives you a proof, and a proof that is going to be distributed across the world, across clients, that a certificate has been locked, and hence it has been issued. It establishes an audit trail from the, for the logging of certificates from all participating CAs. This transparency now allows you to have monitoring for certain events. For example, if you're a domain operator, you could go and monitor logs if some other CA issues certificates for your domain. And of course, this is done for high value domains, in particular Google, Mozilla, Microsoft, these kinds of domains. Now, these are the parties to certificate transparency, the logs in the middle that provide the publicly auditable audit trail. Um, an append only lock of certificates. They also provide proofs of inclusion. Then we have a browser that, who can verify the proof of inclusion and we have a CA that issues certificates. This is the principle. The most common way how this works is the following. We begin in the upper right corner with a CA who issues a so-called pre-certificate. 
this is not a real certificate. It contains a kind of poison string that says, I am not a certificate. But this certificate can be sent to the CT log and it contains all the information needed to create the SCT. The SCT is sent back to the CA, who then goes and includes it in the certificate and uh, issues the entire thing so it can be deployed on a web server. And whenever a browser uh, comes and accesses the web server or receives a certificate, there are certain transformations that can be done. And then the entire certificate and SCT can be validated. That's the mode of operation. Now, as I said, the technology is considerably more complex than I can describe here. In particular, you're going to add several more kinds of monitoring. There's the entire issue. How do I make sure that a log that I'm querying is indeed honest? And here, for example, you can have some kind of uh, cross verification between logs and you can have different uh, monitoring and auditing tools, making sure that they do what they promise to do. There are several options. The last one that I described is the one proposed in the standard, which is to have two kinds of uh, auditing. On the whole, certificate transparency, even though it was pushed into, uh, into the market by a single company, Google was remarkably successful. We already have evidence from the last few years where it detected issuance processes uh, by CAs that did not comply with the governance that was agreed on. And uh, it showed its worth in uh, being able to detect malicious activity or at least rogue activity. It has added transparency to the X509 process in the hope of detecting malicious behavior relatively early. The reinforcement it provides to X509 comes from the fact that it essentially turns PKI inside out. Rather, uh, to, then, rather than being an opaque process, the issue of the certificate is now in the public. And that means there is public pressure on CAs to do their job well. As it is designed, CT is also remarkably strong. There are a number of proposals to reinforce X509, by the way, and CT ranks right at the top as uh, one of the most, uh, one of the strongest ones, able to even thwart attacks by state level attackers. This concludes our entire lecture on PKI. If you have a deeper interest in the topic, I suggest you take follow-up courses on uh, the security of PKI, TLS, and uh, internet security measurement. Thank you for your attention.